I do work for NASA, but NASA didn't pay me to come. They don't pay me to do this work. I have a small business at home that I do this under and have the uh, paperwork from NASA that allows me to do this. So questions about NASA are off the table unless it's in a corner hiding someplace. <clears throat> uh, just to give a little history on this, I, I've been looking at uh, tr trying to figure out how uh, stuff like uh, the, uh, the warp bubble and stuff would actually work from an engineering standpoint and realized earlier in my career that I didn't understand space time at all, so I forgot about it and, and went a different direction. But in about 2005, uh, a professor of mine, or not my professor I worked with, gave me a paper called Chameleon Cosmology and uh, asked me what I thought about it. And after a couple of years of looking at it, uh, I, I said, well, this is a, 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 a model of cosmology that adds a subtraction to gravity. And a subtraction to gravity is really exotic energy for all practical purposes. And so I said, well, if it's a gravitational model, then you should be able to develop it into an acceleration model because Cord and Einstein are really identical. And uh, just, uh, let's see if we can I figure this out. Okay. I'm going to start with the equation I came up with, and then I'll discuss the history behind the, uh, where it came from. But basically, um, there we go. Uh, no mass ejection is required with this acceleration equation, but you still have, need an internal reaction mass is, is required for a thing. Uh, basically, the equation is just the equation of acceleration of any object. Uh, what I call it the acceleration of a density field, and I'll, I'll tell you what a density field is later. Uh, it has these parameters in, which is a phase factor, and I'll get into that here in a second. Uh, and then there's an estimated rate, a radius of the density field, uh, unit vector, to your direction, the gravitation, uh, local gravitation, and this is, would be not just, say, the Earth, but everything that's affecting your, your device here. It's not a vector, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a magnitude. I think there's, uh, yeah, here you go. Uh, this just tells you what these little subscripts mean. If it's a C, it means the, the object under study. Study the uh, um, phi is a density field. Phi A is an accelerated density field, and the M is the local gravity of C. Now we'll get to some fun stuff. A density field is like a warp bubble, and a phase factor is like a time change ratio between the warp bubble and the reaction mass inside the warp bubble. Uh, like I said, the history comes from chameleon cosmology, What's interesting about this, it's not, uh, is the, it's not related directly to the mass of the object, but, but the, the, uh, the field that they talk about, which I call a density field, depends on the local matter density, not the, ma the mass of, the, of it itself. Uh, and I go tangent from the science community on chameleon cosmology, so it, it's not like what you read about chameleon cosmology that I do, it, it's, it's totally different. But they have, there are some papers on chameleon cosmology that relate it to the Casimir force. Uh, let's see. So inside this would be your mass. And then they have a thin shell mechanism, which basically they said there's a thin shell of energy around, a around all objects. And they have a formula that you can uh, calculate the thickness of this uh, thin shell, which I re I'll rewrite on the next slide. Basically, all things have a thin shell of, of, of a given thickness. Let's see, maybe I went too far. Yeah, all things have a thin shell. Okay. And I was able to rewrite their thin shell equation to be more of, of an engineering form that we can understand instead of in the field form that they had. So basically, this is your mass of the object you're studying, the radius of the object you're studying the environmental density outside your object. Uh, this is a reduced Planck length, which is given down here. This they call an energy scale factor, and I, and I had to rewrite that to fit what I'm doing, but I'll show you on the next slide. And then I just uh, simplified all this mess here to this case of zero factor. Most of this is constant, except your atmosphere can change. Okay. What they point out in their paper is that using a power, this power law equation, that if you set N and B basically to one, they say unity one, then this energy factor is on, on the order of these values. We're concerned with this one, which is one millimeter to the minus one. 
But my analysis, I said n equal 2, and, and the beta factors are not necessarily the order of unity. And when you do this, then the energy factor comes out to be this equation, which has your cosmological constant in it, but in units of meters, not, not your energy per meters cubed, divided by the Planck length, which turns out to be this, which is about a factor of a 10 smaller than what they say, what they, they're quoting in their paper. Uh, there was something, what was that? Okay, that's cosmological constant. If you take their thin shell equation and assume a single mass in a mini universe with no other masses out there, then you can actually uh, uh, determine the thin shells as you move away from that mass. So it turns out to be just rings of these thin shells away from the mass. Uh, if you apply uh, Susskind's interpretation of entanglement to the thin shell mechanism then, in chameleon cosmology, one can allow the thin shells to be the observer between the object's density and its surrounding environment, whereby changes in these densities can invoke changes to the thin shell thickness in order to conserve both entanglement and energy between the two densities. Basically what that, that's, that tells you is, is that these thin shells uh, can conserve both momentum and energy within these thin shells. If you use the interpretation of entanglement that uh, came out of space news, then space-time entanglement is not a physical connection but a shared history. This is a little bit different concept than entanglement under quantum mechanics. That is, empty space in the universe is a time-wise compilation of the thin shell energies generated from the, from the mass in the universe over time. That is, the fabric of space-time is composed of thin shells. The uh, chameleon cosmology force equation is basically, give my errors, gravity force plus a chameleon force. Uh, let me go back. But the chameleon force is a negative force, and this is the basic equation side for the chameleon force. And you can pull out of there uh, chameleon acceleration, which is negative, and given this form, which this beta is. Uh, is just a coupling factor, and in, and in chameleon cosmology, that's, that's set to one, uh, but in mine, it's not, so I'll keep it. Uh, you, you can calculate the thin shell from the equation I gave you, uh, the radius of the object you're talking about, and then the gravitational force on it, so it's all calculable. I wanted to point out, though, is that if you calculate the thin shell thickness for the Earth, it's, it's on order of 10 to the minus 14 meters, so it's very small. You can't see it. You can almost call it the fifth dimension if you wanted to. <clears throat> okay. Given that the fabric of space-time is composed of thin shells and that the chameleon acceleration is a subtraction from gra gravity, crap, <laughs> Then, when, then, then under warp drive ter terminology, the energy in a thin shell is exotic energy. And I just pointed out that, that, that this exotic energy is in shells. That it's time compilated to the whole universe. So the whole universe contains exotic energy all the way through it. So you don't really need to create it. It's already there. You just need to figure out how to use it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and the acceleration model I came up with was that, uh, that if you... If you can, uh, you can set this thin shells to eternity within the universe up like this equation. You, you still have your density, but in, in this equation, it's the accelerated density field, which I'll talk about later, and the estimated radius of the acceleration density field. Basically, the density field is the spherical um, mass within any one of these rings that you, that you set up. So it contains both the mass is density and the density within the thin shell. Uh, where am I at? Okay. Whereby the acceleration of an object is due to the change in the object's density field or thin shell thickness in the direction of motion in order to conserve momentum between the object and the thin shell while still conserving the entanglement energy between the object's density and its environmental density. Uh, uh, well, I'll get this thing. For random non-internal reaction mass acceleration, what I mean by this is that if you, set, if you have an object and within an object you have particulates in the object accelerating in a given direction rather than randomly. Uh, so I'm, 
then for if you look at a ballistic object, a ballistic object, you're a whale. Then your reaction mass is the mass of the entire object, and the entire object has has an acceler has acceleration, and but there's no mass ejection. So your density field equation then becomes the accelerated density field is in the density of the object plus the acceleration of the object divided by the gravitational force on the object times the density of the object. And then this is just your density equation, but I'm calculating this estimated R for the density field, and then you can write the equation from that for, for what this estimated uh, radius is. And I call this a type, type one, because in a, in a type one, you know what your acceleration is, and you know what particulates are being accelerated. In, in a type two, you, you don't know the acceleration and you don't know the particulates that's actually being accelerated. And then a, from a rocket standpoint, and only putting the, uh, the, the uh, density field, density of the density field equation for the nozzle, there's also one for the rocket itself because it's losing mass, so there's a change in the density field of it also. But it turns out to be negative because you're losing the mass. The acceleration of exhausted mass over the gravitational force on that, that times the density of the exhausted mass, uh, which you can actually calculate, but I left it off. Um, and then it's your density uh, equation again, so you can get. But in here, you can act, this actually turns out, uh, this ra uh, radius actually turns out to be known. It's the square root of the, of the uh, rocket exit. Uh, plane, and and there's some reasons for that, but I'm not going to go into here. Uh, but but in general, we're not interested in case one or case three because those there's known equations for those, so, so you can really forget about it. But I'll talk more about it. And what I'm going to talk about is the entanglement drive, which is basically similar to the warp drive, but it, it it's uh, graphically differently different. The equations are, are more engineering light. In fact, if you understand everything I'm saying, anybody in this room could walk out of here and start making a, a warp driver and, and trying to invent one. Uh, but we had to start someplace, I guess. Uh, so the entanglement drive that I'm calling here is an object with, with the reaction mass, m sub k less than the total mass of the object, and the, this reaction mass is having, has an acceleration, a sub k, that, that's uh, greater than the acceleration of the, of, of the object. Uh, and there's no mass ejection. So the density of the density field then becomes the density of the object, the ratio of the acceleration of the of these reaction mass to the gravity times the density of that reaction mass and, the, and your density equation again so you can figure R and there's an equation for R. But what you find out in here is you have a ratio of your reaction mass to your total mass of your object and, 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 and plus the acceleration. And what you'll typically find out in most situations is as, as acceleration gets higher, this mass gets smaller, you know, like photons. Their mass is very small, but it, they go at the speed of light. Okay, now given that the fabric of space-time is composed of thin shells and that the energy in the thin shell is exotic energy, then an accelerated density field is just a warp bubble. Okay. Uh, there's a little bit of difference in the way you, you look at contraction and expansion from the two models, but they're basically the forces are the same. Uh, the, in here, your, your thin shell is, is contracting uh, because the density in the object is getting lar lar larger on this side where the, where the thin shell is expanding here because your density is getting smaller on, the, on, on this side. And it, and it all goes back to that thin shell equation. Uh, but it, but they have similarities, that's what I wanted to point out, okay. Um, under the acceleration model, if you go back to the, the uh, chameleon model, you, I found out that the, the, the thin shell is actually approximately equal to a coupling factor of gravity, which under the chameleon model, this is set to one. And so for the Earth, uh, the thin shell is actually the square root of Planck constant, uh, Planck length times the uh, radius of the Earth. And if you just rewrite this into the, this acceleration form, all I'm really doing is just changing the subscripts here, uh, then, they, then it comes out very similar. Uh, okay, 
go back. Oh, yeah. Good skipping. But then I found out in a couple other papers I wrote that you can rewrite that thin shell acceleration equation into a phase factor and adding a uh, acceleration coupling factor. And then when you put that back, well, okay, so the phase factor actually turns out to be uh, the time rate of change of the density field divided by the time rate of change of the ex uh, accelerated mass. But I had to add a, a, a little factor, and the reason I had to add that little factor was because of this guy right here. This is an actuator, but it's made a little bit different than normal actuators. I can't go into it because I want to be writing a patent on an acceleration device. Uh, but uh, it puts out about a 20, 20 pound impulse, but it's only like for tens of milliseconds. But the calculations, using these formulas, it says if I can pulse this one and a half times per second, it'll put out about a pound of force. It's just a little bitty thing. <laughs> And putting out 20 pounds is interesting too. But the uh, equ equation said it should, said, actually, I was able to finish my equations by taking the data that I did on the on load cell measurements of this, backing out the uh, parameters into my equation, and then I was able to write the ballistic equation, and I'll also another equation, which I'll sh show towards the end here. But getting back to this, uh, then I, you know, I set these time rates up to the phase and, and the K for the mass. Uh, it turns out that I, I call these a universe normalization of the uh, time rate of change of the, of the mass over the universe normalization of the time rate change of the field, or the thin shell density field, which then you know, I give you these terminologies. But basically, the phase can be looked at as a time rate of change of the warp bubble that's around, around your vehicle. I had something else. And where this is your time rated change of your, uh, um, your your reaction mass. I thought I put that in there, I guess. Okay. And then you can write the equations for the, for the, for the phase for each one of these cases I wrote. But, but what I found out is that in the ballistic case, the time rated, uh, uh, the time rated change of the, uh, the universe normalization of the, of the density field is equal to the time rated change of the, of the, of the density field. And, and then the time rate of change of the universe normalization of the, of the mass is equal to this guy. We'll remember that the, this m value has this cosmological constant in it. This, is, this guy, uh, these, you'll see two of these, one for the mass and one for the, uh, uh, the field. And I call them a geometric factor because basically when you're talking about the universe, you're looking at a different scale than you're talking about the object you're looking at. And they tend to have to be just factors of pi. Let's see. Well, so basically when you put all these into the equation, your, your phase just turns out to, to, to be just your geometric factor times the energy scale times the radius of the object for the ballistic case. For the rocket case, it turns out that the uh, normalization factors are equal, so they drop out and you only have the two times between the, the density field change and the mass field. And, the, and then you can write this in terms of the rocket, rocket parameters themselves, where like I said, this just turns out to be the square root of your uh, rocket nozzle exit plane. And this is your exit velocity, your mass flow rate, and the mass that you've expelled. Okay, go back to Tango Drive, because this is the important thing. Uh, it turns out that these uh, universe normalizations are not equal, or they're not equal to the, uh, the uh, time rate of change of the field of mass, but they contain them. So, the, so both of the, these two values actually drop out and you end up with a phase that's just in terms of your geometric factor, your energy scale factor. This is the distance that your reaction mass moves inside, your, uh, inside the object you have and then the radius. So, okay, let's move on. And like I said, I wanted to point out that these guys are, uh, uh, they tend to be geometric factors, which in case one and case zero, they just turn out to be something times pi. And this is basically the acceleration equation I gave you at the beginning, uh, but then using that form of, uh, of the thin shell that has the phase in it, it turns out to be this, which this is what I gave you at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, accelerate density field and pointing out that the, this is the chameleon acceleration portion, except I had a minus sign in the beginning. I don't put a minus sign in here because this is the acceleration and the vectors wherever your, your acceleration is pointed at. Okay. And just to recap, I, I give you the, the, the what, what, I've, what I have shown in my papers that the this uh, density field accelerated uh, acceleration is basically equal to just whatever force you applied on your ballistic object divided by the mass of the object, which is just your acceleration. So these two accelerations are the same. So like I said, you don't need to use this complicated equation because you can just use this simple equation, and we don't need all this other mess to worry about. And then case three is the same. Uh, I've, sh I've shown that the, this complicated equation here, uh, which, which these R values are given here, it's just basically equal to your, your, your thrust at burnout over the mass at burnout, which is equal to your rocket acceleration. I, I found lots of cases uh, where this, uh, this is just like a correction factor, where this is close to one, and in some cases where it's 10 times off of one. And I, and I think the problem is, that as, is the values I use is the values that they have in their papers, which is an average exit velocity and an average uh, mass flow rate, which is not, these two values aren't really the values that you burn out. And, and more than likely, you're going to have to integrate these. But like I said, there are cases where this is one, and, and so it comes out. Okay. Where am I at? The entanglement drive case here. Okay. I put this in because somebody said they didn't understand what I was talking about. So basically, hey, you have an object, which is the gray area here. And within the object, you have a an uh, accelerated reaction mass going in one direction, but you, it doesn't leave the mass, so, it, so it's going to have to go backwards, or you're only going to get one pulse out of it. So you have to allow it to uh, relax into your into your object at a slower acceleration than you're accelerating in the direction you want to go. And so that the the uh, so if your forward acceleration is greater than your backward acceleration, then you should have a a, a net acceleration on the object based upon these, these equations. An the equation for that then just comes out to be this. I just the ED is so the, the uh, entanglement drive. So you have a forward acceleration and a backward acceleration, but, but you have to do that periodically, otherwise you won't get any acceleration out of it. So there, there, there has to be an ex, uh, a frequency term, so it's a frequency in which you're doing this. Uh, and because you put that frequency term in, you have to have a time term, and the time term turns out to be the, 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 the time change of the density field itself rather than the time that you're applying your energy to the system. And these are just the generalized equations for, for, for that setup. Okay. And then this is the data I got on, on this guy right here. And uh, to explain it a little bit, uh, from here to here is your th thrust because you're moving a, you're moving a mass, so there's a thrust associated with that movement. But it's also you have to add the uh, this, this, the force due to this the density field change, and the force due to the density field change is in the direction of the motion where where would I do? Where, where the thrust is in the opposite direction. So, so from, you know, from here to here is just this part. And then, then from, from, from here is when you, you're, the actuator impacts, you're, you're, or, you're, or the armature impacts the actuator. And then your motion stops here, which basically is your impact force plus what was left over in this guy. And what you see, it comes out to be about uh, about 20, 21 and a half, uh, or 20, 20 and a half uh, pounds of force. And so when I s set these equations up, we, I, know, I can measure the mass of the whole actuator, so it tells me that m my acceleration had to be this. And then when I set these other equations up, I find out that this geometric value turns out to be about 8 pi times some correction factor, which this contraction correction factor basically is the difference between your experiments and your and, and your equations 
the the, uh, the estimated radius didn't have to add anything to it. I just put I, I know what the armature acceleration was. I can calculate it from the data. I know what the mass of the armature is. I know what the gravitational mass of the Earth is. I know what the actuator mass is. So, and I know what the radius of the actuator is. So I get that value. So really, the only thing I needed to to figure out was what these two geometric value terms were, which I, I know have to be some factor of pi. And by the way, 8 pi is a pretty known uh, value within cosmology, so it's kind of natural that it came out to be 8 pi. But, and when you use 8 pi, you find out that this correction factor is only about, about 1.025. So it's about 2% off, uh, 2, 3% off. And then I took what I did in all this and looked at uh, Dr. Woodward's mock effect thruster. I don't know how many of you are aware of what he's doing. But he's basically taking some piezoelectric stacks and uh, oscillate them, and he's seeing, a, a, seeing millinewtons or micronewtons of force with the thing. So I took the, one of the papers that his um, protege, Heidi Fern, uh, published, and, and they had four data points, which is these triangle shapes here. And then, and then I looked at the equations I had, and then I, I was able to write an equation that basically, you, you, in these piezoelectrics, you have uh, a force due to the applied voltage and then a reaction for mechanical reaction of it coming back. So, you, so, so you have to look at the basically the forward acceleration and the backward acceleration in these in these models. And then I determined that the these time parameters are, are these values here. What uh, just your um, your estimated uh, radius of density field. When, when you're in the voltage mode and, you're, and your speed of the uh, density field change just turns out to be C. The, the reason I, this stuff is in red is I, I didn't ca actually calculate the, uh, the force of the backward stuff. I, I, just, I, I, I just took uh, this part right here and, and plotted it. And, and when you plot it, it came out from zero and, and came up here uh, and follows this curve basically. So basically, all I was able, to, all I had to do was subtract this amount from 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 that, and it followed this path that matched their data. So 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 what I'm saying is, if if somebody can calculate the mechanical force going backwards on it, it should be about that value. Uh, which is which is this value right here, and then all the parameters that I put into it. The phase factor came out to be just uh, three fourths pi, which is your geometric factor. I use this value of, of me, which is this guy here, uh, times the radius of their um, mock thruster, and all. And that data was in their paper. Turned out that their estimated radius of the, of the density field turned out to be this, and because it's this, it 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 it, it, it says that this uh, time rate of change of the field is equal to the time rate of change of the normalization of the field, and I believe that's because of this uh, because of the c value that you have in uh, in this time frame. Uh, speed of the universe is c, so the speed of your your field change has to be c. And the distance that the piezoelectrics move is given by this equation, and that's what went into here. And the fact that it, just by subtracting such a small amount, you, you get the trace, tells me that, uh, that, that this equation is uh, really, really close to what it should be. It may not be exact. There may be some changes in, 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 in here, but it's not going to be very much. I think that's the it. No. Let's see. A new propulsionless space drive or entanglement drives or warp drives can all use this equation. So you guys can go out and start building warp drives if you want to using this equation. What what I can't tell you right now is what reaction mass you use for the warp drive, how you accelerate that reaction mass, or how you catch that reaction mass. Because it's more than likely going to have to be some particle that's moving at the speed of light to begin with. Um, so basically, all you really using this equation, all you need to know is the forward and backward acceleration and frequency of the acceleration of your reaction mass. So I think I just said that, and that's it. Y'all know how to wake the work drive now? <laughs>
last equation, uh, f has to be the same in both terms, right? Uh, f, A, W, and the frequency has to be the same. It's the same mass moving back and forth, right? Yeah, or am I got to missing something entirely? It, it, it doesn't have to be, but will almost always will be. Because you could be doing one of these at one time and then 10 months later do the other time. And so those frequencies can change. Uh, but typically, if you're doing, typically, if you're doing it correctly, yeah, the frequencies are the same. Yeah. <clears throat> so that means that the that, that DTA on both sides, so, so why wouldn't DTA on both sides, one forward, one back, why won't they be the same? They can be the same. Then, and you, it, then you get no acceleration. If, you, if your accelerations are the same, then you get no acceleration on the vehicle, correct. That's the reason why the, your, your relaxation acceleration has to be slower than your forward acceleration. And that's probably well, acceleration times the time. Yeah. Because if it's, it's a mm -hmm. longer time, then. And, and it's that reason that we, that we, it's this reason why we probably don't see it in nature because almost always your, your accelerated, uh, your, your particle acceleration and its relaxation acceleration are the same. So we're ha in this case, you're having to come up with a situation where they're different in order to see that. And, and like I said, I can, I can do this with this, but I, because of my patent, I can't tell you how I'm doing it. <laughs> and I've shown you that, I, that, that, that uh, an equation for the Mach thruster, which they're seeing micronewtons of force in that, in, in that. So, and my next step is to write an equation for the EM drive. But, uh, but this will actually put the EM drive and the Mach thruster to bed, because I can get newtons of force, and they're seeing millinewtons and micronewtons in theirs. Next. Other than this chart I showed you, I said I can't really do much. I, I'm in the process of, 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 of uh, putting together another experimental device that will allow me to accelerate this in the, in the same direction, whatever pulse, so that I can verify that I'll get my uh, one newton of force, uh, average one newton of force out of it. In, are you going to try to sell that for like small sats that uh, essentially commercialize it? I just do it? this because it's interesting. If I make money on the way, that's just the plus. But probably right. Yeah. Uh, if you only, if all you want is a 20 pound force for a, for 10 milliseconds, then this will do it right now. Awesome. Anybody else? Yeah. Don't you need to bring Okay, cool. I'm scared to ask a question now. Um, it might be a really dumb question, but I was always thought that forces were equal and opposite. So no matter if you're putting force in one direction, and no matter how much you, you're bringing that same object back, it will still take the same amount of energy overall. In the case of this actuator, you're having a thrusting force in one direction, a um, impact force in the second direction. The energy in both of them are equal, but the forces actually can be different. So that's the reason why you get jiggle in your, uh, in your data when you're hitting things with a hammer, you know, and stuff like that. But these equations say there's a thir third force, which is this chameleon acceleration times the mass of your object that, that occurs when something inside your object's moving. And, and so that's always in the direction of the movement of those particles. <laughs>